All right, welcome to another episode of DEI in Five. Today I am joined by, or with, joined with, joined by, Lord have mercy, my brain is not working, with Karen Young, my good friends, um, who you've probably seen if you have watched any of my content. Karen Young, aka The Professional Adult, I will be sure to link all of her socials, website, all that good jazz down below. Um, we had plans to talk about and kind of go on a rant today about our experience recently with Udemy. Um, but I think we're going to save that for another time. And just in short, for anyone listening, especially for any DEI professionals or anyone that is a, a digital entrepreneur that has explored creating e-courses, Udemy business is a joke for lack of better words, yeah. we saw a significant increase in the number of students in our e-courses. We have two e-courses that we co-created on Udemy, Karen and I, and we saw like, I think we have over 300, approaching 400 students now. And a lot of those came through from Udemy business. And their pricing model when we signed up was not very transparent. It wasn't very clear in terms of how much you get paid. And we recently just saw our payout from the past month with hundreds of students. And we are each receiving roughly, I think, what, $70? And our course itself is priced at $99.99, so basically $100. So we're not even getting paid for as if we had one student purchase our course. It, I can't wrap my head around it, but... Like I said, we're not we're not gonna spend today's session talking about that. We'll do a deeper dive. I think it's worth us maybe doing a video soon about just how we're thinking about diversifying our income moving forward. Um, due to the fact, and this is what we really wanna talk about today, that people are claiming that DEI is dead or dying. Um, and I don't know about you, but I am just so frustrated between the the, low effort chat GPT articles that people are producing about DEI that they don't research or don't tweak or try to even attempt to adjust. And I know it's a chat GPT article because I use chat GPT myself and I also understand how it writes. I also went to J school, so I'm very familiar <laughs> with journalism and writing articles and knowing that an article should not conclude with in summary and two to three sentences that don't quite summarize the rest of the article, which is what one of the many failures of chat GPT. But it just really pisses me off that people are just producing articles, especially about DEI and other topics that are as sensitive as this and not second guessing what's coming out, not trying to offer up solutions to, to problems that they're calling out. Um, and that is, I think, uh, one of the bigger issues that we see in the DEI space is people always want to share information. They want to call out problems. They want to point a finger. They want to share a data set or a study that concluded this, but no one ever wants to freaking come up with actions, actionable solutions and a plan for how to shift things. Um, and the other thing is that DEI is not dead. It's not dying. It may be, we, I think we're <laughs> at war for lack of better words in this space because so many people, especially from a political agenda standpoint on the conservative side and the far right are so eager to ban DEI across the private sector, across academia. I've posted plenty of videos about this recently, about what's been going on and what's happening in the news. Um, the recent collapse with uh, Silicon Valley Bank, there was a wonderful conservative, bu conservative businessman who wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about how they were likely distracted by diversity um, <laughs> demands, which is a, uh, I forgot I have to censor myself before I hit the five minute mark on YouTube so I don't get banned, but a freaking joke. Like, can we please for just five seconds be serious? Like... The bank, the, the board of directors at SVP is amongst the like least diverse when it comes to banks across the country. On top of that, so I mean, we're blaming the one black man that was on there, please. On top of that, historically, the financial industry has lacked diversity. We've seen banks redline 
um, uh, uh, people across the across the country. We've seen redlining. We've seen discriminatory practices. There is a, comp- a bank now that is now owing millions, if not billions, um, to settle some discrimination uh, cases as it relates to housing and and unfair, inequitable loans. So this is real stuff we're talking about. I know I just went on a rant, but I had to set the scene for why we're here today and what we're talking about. But Karen is is DEI dead? So to use a phrase that I see on social media a lot, um, because my my background is in the social sciences, so I spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. observing and analyzing media inputs and outputs, um, to use a phrase and to make sure it is censored enough for YouTube, be so for real right now. Like, please. Be so for real right now. Of, Of course, of course DEI isn't dead, but like usual, this is the same circular patterns that we've been seeing since the 90s. I mean, I'd, I'd even maybe even push back even as far back as yeah, the 1964 and 65 yeah. Civil Rights Act. Like, it's absolutely cyclical. We talked about this in the 90s and mm-hmm. we talked about diversity training. We talked about this in the 2000s when we talked about cultural competencies. You know, we talked about this in the early 2010s when we talked about right. uh, diversity training. Like, again, it's had a new name. And it cycled through every single time. I think though it's different this time is that more people found that they were yep. able to make a buck off of it. And so I think that's what's dying is the fact that the grifters are mm-hmm. realizing they can't grift anymore. So they are moving on. And they're saying that because they can't grift, and frankly, I'm calling out folks who are skin who are mm. skin folk but ain't kin folk. I'm calling out folks who are part of marginalized communities, but don't really have a Mm -hmm. heart for marginalized communities. They saw a buck. They saw a way of making some money into it. And now that people are starting to push back, they're walking away because it's not an easy buck anymore. And I fully, I fully expect that in the next five to 10 years, there'll be another wave of it. Something else will happen. There'll be another wave and grifters will come on back. And those who are, those of us who are here, who are truly committed to enacting change or no matter hard, how slow it difficult. truly is or exactly are going to get out you know and we've talked a little bit about, before about how many folks who are in the industry are burning out and leaving i think some of that burnout is happening because there are just so many people in in the industry who don't right, really care right. about the industry they care about they care about hyping their own name they care about clout they care about yep. being a face of something uh, they care about getting their buck or getting their mm-hmm. book deal or getting whatever, but they don't yep. care and, about and the actual work. I think, you know, one of the things I've noticed is people try, are constantly trying to make DEI palatable for other folks. And I mean, yes, there has to be some level of, I want you to actually hear me out without you shutting down because there's a level, There's, I mean, all of this is centered around human psychology, but for me to have to shuck and jive and try to conform I, probably why I'm not getting as many speaking engagements and work because I, how I speak on my YouTube, how I speak to you is how I speak whenever I'm doing this work. It is, it is very to the point is very matter of fact, and is very much about taking action. And there are so few people that really want to take action. And I think that's one of the things people keep calling out is like DEI, you know, this performative DEI is dead. Yeah, it's been dead. And we've been saying that people should go beyond trying to do performative work. Um, but because so many people, to your point, leaned into that to make money, people were making thousands, um, uh, of, of dollars on DEI trainings with very little experience, if any experience at all. Um, and then you've got people that are still doing the same. I always say the MS DOS version of, uh, required diversity training that looks like it came out of the prehistoric era that doesn't help anyone. Um, and it's like, we keep rinsing and repeating. And so uh, because a lot of organizations have done that, that's one thing we're seeing. We've seen, like you said, people that are coming into the space, don't know what they're doing or just trying to make a quick book. We're also seeing a political agenda that we haven't seen in recent years be pushed very, very heavily. Um, which, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke about this earlier on leadership, my podcast, if for anyone that hasn't, uh, subscribed. It drops every Thursday. So you'll hear me ranting about this there too. But, um, I just talked about the fact that 
I am convinced that because there are so many conservative folks behind these organizations and companies, they are sending messages to the folks running, running the show day to day to say, you need to drop this DEI stuff because it doesn't fit my political agenda or otherwise I'm taking back my coins. So a lot of organizations are dialing back DEI initiatives because their board of directors, their VCs, their investors don't want to hear it. And so in order to save face and to save coin in their companies, that's what they're doing. Um, and so we're seeing fewer DEI roles mm -hmm. and fewer c support and now even bans where people aren't even allowed to take into consideration inequity when hiring or admitting students to schools, which is just like, <sighs> um, but yeah, it, but the thing is just... the DEI space, like all other spaces and industries is a constant work in progress. It's just, it's newer. And because it is so centered around humans and our world, it changes a lot more rapidly than other industries. Like if you compare it to the legal industry, we're still trying to deal with the same laws that again, have been here since the prehistoric era and still make them conform. But because there are so many layers to actually changing the laws that we have currently and, and so much bureaucracy involved, it takes a very long time. DEI on the other hand has no sort of formal regulation at the moment. And so things can change very quickly. And it's like, it, 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 boggles my mind how quickly people are to throw DEI under the bus because something didn't work or something didn't go their way over the past, like two years. Mm -hmm. Again, can we please be for real? Like change takes time. Like it's not going to necessarily happen in our lifetime even. And so there needs to be some grace there. And I think there also needs to be some respect for the people that again, keep coming back and doing this work. Like I've said so many times, even off camera, Karen, we've had these conversations where I'm like, I think I'm done with DEI. Like I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. I say it like every few months because it is so taxing. And yet I keep coming back because I care about it. I'm passionate about this work. It doesn't make me money. Yes, but I'm making a hell of a lot less than a lot of folks out here working in this space that are taking advantage of it. I try yeah. to actually think about equity when I charge people for my work. Sometimes I do free work because I care about this work and I want to see change happen. But it pisses me off to no end when I see someone start off an article saying DEI equals dead end initiatives. Like, and it's, it, it, and yes, I continue to read what they were talking about and what other articles like this talk about. And usually it concludes that our current way of doing DEI isn't working, but for people that lack, right. But I let's think about people that don't read people that like love sound bites. They grab onto the first thing they see. They don't even skim the article. They're going to take that and be like, well, this person who, you know, is a top voice or a DEI expert said DEI equals a dead end initiative. So why are we still doing this? And that's what kills exactly. me the most because I see exactly. it day in and day out, the pushback that people experience and that we receive. And it is so frustrating and it is so dangerous to see things like that be shared without any additional context and without any solutions for how to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I, I think what, what bothers me the most is you know, one, one of the things that we do as DEI practitioners is create solutions, especially where there aren't any, because we, so many of our clients and so many of the people that we work with are all, again, very well-intentioned or, mm -hmm. you know, have good hearts, but really just don't know what to do. So we come in and we right. pretty much tell them what to do. To read articles like this, makes people feel so discouraged and so disillusioned that it just gets to the point where folks are like, well, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. And what that does is that really harms folks from marginalized communities who need the support. You know, because, because you wanted clicks, because you wanted something that was eye-catchy, you're ultimately going to harm somebody who's in an organization who could have had support building an ERG or who could have had support, you know, with a growth and training plan, but instead the person who would write the check now sees right. this and goes, well, it's not going to matter anyway. Right. Oh, cause you wanted some clicks. 
and I need I need people to start thinking more broadly than their own head and more broadly than their own their yeah. own like little little moments. I, I I need I need people to really start thinking bigger, and yep. it, it's distressing that they're not. I mean, I think. Um, <laughs> I know people, and I just linked you to something. Uh, I'm censoring myself today because I'm having a week, but I I just. I think when you decide to be in this work in, in DEI, you're taking on a selfless approach to what you're doing in this space. And there, believe me, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I rant all the time and I don't think it's my place to educate or teach other people 24 seven, but at the same time, this is the work that I've chosen to do. And there's almost always some mm-hmm. amount of education that comes along with that especially when you have a following or when you have influence over a significant amount of people. I have very little following in the grand scheme of things <laughs> compared to a lot of people working in this space, but I'm still very much aware of how I deliver the things I say because I want people to be thinking f- to be forward thinking no matter what. Yes, you can rant, you can kick, you can scream, you can cry about what's going on. And I do that, but I also like to think about, and what? And and so what? <laughs> and what's next? What do we do about it? I, how do we keep people caring? Because I recognize how dangerous it is to just say, well, this thing isn't working, so. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I, think, I think that that's what I struggle with the most is, and again, because because of my social science background, I understand mm-hmm. subtext and I understand the semantics of what's being said right. and what's being translated. And I understand that and I'm and I'm sure that once this article gets out more broadly and people start pushing back that the writer is gonna start walking this back and saying, But what I meant to say, like I, I know that's gonna mm-hmm. happen because it happens all the time. But I think the problem is is that folks say things and don't understand right. how it's going to be translated. And what what I think the articles write or what I've seen for articles who are written in a similar fashion, what they're saying is, like you just said, we need to come up with a new paradigm of how we think about DEI work. And the ways that we're currently thinking about DEI work is no right. longer accurate. But that's true with how we think about the concept of work in general. And I won't get on my high horse about the concept of Mm -hmm. work and how it's changed. But our concept of work is different. So when you know better, you do better. And I think that DEI is now at a point where we now know better, so we have to do better. But there's more money to be made in not doing better. And so a lot of people aren't doing better because, frankly, the checks are better. And so... I think what we're going to see now is that folks like us are going to call folks like that out and then they're going to walk it back. And then it's going to be like, well, but what I really meant was this, or what we're really talking about is this. And then they'll kind of make that little smooth pivot over to what they were trying to say, instead of just saying stuff with their chest to begin with. And that to me, I find that more insulting than anything. Yeah. I'm just, I'm accepting that this year, I'm just not going to be, um, a DEI person that is going to be liked in this space because I just can't be quiet when I see the bullshit at this point. Um, and yeah, (laughs) I just, I just can't like, it, it just, it pisses me off to no end because again, I see, and I have conversations. I mean, I spend, I tell people this over and over. I, the bulk of the work that I do is working very closely with senior executives. Those are the people making the decisions behind the scenes. I'm working with leaders. I'm working with board members. I'm working with VC folks. I'm working with investors to coach them on DEI. And the way they think when they see something like this is, oh, that DEI thing, no. So that is why I like, I go so hard when I see things like this, like less so for me, like, yeah, it makes me feel like, well, damn, you don't give a shit about what I'm doing. But aside from that, because I've grown (laughs) thick enough skin at this point to be be like, whatever, I'm gonna keep pushing. The impact that it has on the decision makers, the leaders is what is so problematic for me. Because to your point, yes, we, we know how to interpret this. We know what you're going for, but the average person does not the average american household let's take a step back 
still can't even explain to you what DEI even is. I mean, I can't tell you how many people, I live in New York, in New York, a metropolitan city. I can't tell you how many people I've encountered that I've networked with, interacted with, and I tell them what I do. And they're like, what's DEI? What's, what's that? They have no oh, idea. Exactly. And then I explain it to them and like, oh, snap, that's important. Okay. Okay. But they have no idea or concept. They've never heard of it. Or mm -hmm. if they hear it, they're like, oh, that, you know, diversity thing, race. And I'm like, it's a lot more complex than that. It's a lot more strategic than no. that. And there's a lot more moving pieces. So I just think about also the education level in this country and just reading comprehension. Like if we're being really r serious, like... I think on average, the, the cutoff is like a sixth grade reading level or something like that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I was, I was talking, I was talking with my mm -hmm. mom who, who lives in Houston and I was talking with her about the, the bands, the, the bands on DEI and, and my mom, my mom's a smart lady. She, you know, just retired as a nurse. Like yeah. she's, she's a smart, smart lady. And she was like, wait, wait, but that doesn't make any sense. Like, like, why, why would you want to ban making sure everybody mm -hmm. has the same opportunities and access like that? Isn't that against what you say yes. you're trying to do? And I was like, well, mom, <laughs> yes. that's the work that I do every day. And she was like, oh, yeah. oh honey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's what, oh. that's what they're trying to do to an extent, <laughs> like, right? Now that, yeah. But, but, Right. But, you know, but I, I say all that to say, again, my mom is a smart lady. She is well aware mm -hmm. of everything that is going on in the world. She mm -hmm. lives in Houston. And we were talking about yeah. that University of Houston article. Had no idea. Had no idea and had no idea about a lot yeah. of the DEI stuff that's happening. And so if someone like my mom, who is really smart and really active and really connected, doesn't get that, my goodness, the hope for anybody who's just yeah. kind of not as connected. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so I yes. so again just kind of connecting that back yes. to the conversations you have with VCs and you know founders and such, like they're concerned about building their, their businesses and they're concerned about yep. other stuff. Don't make exactly. this harder. Don't make exactly. this harder for And folks. that's unfortunately where we are. Um it's so sad, like, just going back to you, Sharon, you know, about your mom, like, how little media coverage there has been. Like, she lives literally there in the state and hasn't seen much about it. I mean, I, I had to dig a little bit to find anything about it. And most of the articles were um, from Texas, Texas media outlets, and there wasn't a ton around it. There still isn't a lot because now we're all distracted by SVP, which we know was, you know, a result of the one black <laughs> board member that they have like no and not and not and it has nothing to do with peter teal who managed to pull out a whole bunch of cash right before it happened to go that i'm pulling out my cash i mean i'm not saying like that, i'm not saying that could have caused a run on the thing i'm just saying you know had what a nothing surprise. to do with the um act that trump signed into law back in 2018 that um deregulated what you mean rolling, uh -huh, rolling back, that pull back some of the what? regulations within the financial industry has nothing to do with the fact that they were making a lot of poor decisions behind the scenes as it relates to loans and interest rates and ipos and all that stuff no they were too distracted by diversity demands exactly <laughs> Oh, goodness. It, it's something. I'm I'm curious to see how this plays out. And another thing that I just like can't let go of is just how quickly they were to solve this or fix this um, collapse. Like it, it, they fixed it in like 24, 48 hours. Meanwhile, we've had issues that have gone for decades long mm. that probably could have also been fixed in 24 to 48 hours. But here we are. What a society. Yeah, yeah, it, it didn't. It didn't hurt the right people. There it didn't go. hurt the right people, so it's fine. <sighs> well, it's, it's fine. I think that's that's pretty much it for our our soapbox today. Any additional words before we <laughs> we yeah. step off and drop the mic? <laughs> um, all right. I, I think I think the only thing that I would say is just a reminder to folks that. Be mindful of how things are going to be received as you say them. And, and yes, feel free to, you know, speak your truth, believe what you want, you know, whatever, whatever. But 
be mindful of how that information is going to be received and be mindful of who will mm-hmm. be collateral damage from how yeah. you put stuff. Very important. Um, <laughs> I had a, I have an example I'll share. Um, I think I told you about this, how I almost got canceled like a month or so ago. Did I tell you about this? Um, so there was Maybe. a, there's a, a vegan um, food brand that makes fake meat. And mm-hmm. it's based in, uh, I'm not going to give too many details, but it's based in another country. Um, their internal team is not very diverse at all. Um, and so they did a promo with a vegan influencer along with some celebrities, both all of which are black or identify as black. And I just saw it and I was just like, it makes me so, I pretty much did a a video and I was like, it's so discouraging how so many brands will lack diversity internally, but when it comes to promoting their products, they almost always will use black and brown folks to, to make some sales. And apparently the, the influencer is friends with the person at, is friends with one of the owners of the brand. And uh, was like, you're totally wrong about this and blah, blah, blah. And so I took it down, but I still stand by what I said. Because Mm -hmm. just because you work in or have a company based out of another country that lacks diversity doesn't give you a reason not to have diversity internally. And it's also very apparent, again, when people, when companies are trying to target specific audiences. Could my delivery on the video have been different? Sure. Like, but at the start of the video, I'm like, I think it's great for these people to be getting their coin, the black folks involved. I, that was what I started with. I'd never complain about that. But this person was like, oh, you should apologize to the founder for what? For calling them out on not having diversity and for, for not taking into consideration. They're like, oh, well, they don't have a lot of diversity over there. We are in a digital first global society at this point. There's no excuse for you not to diversify your workforce. No excuse other than you don't want to. But you, but you also then, you also then confirmed, you then confirmed what I just said though. You know, but just a good example. I just wanted to share that as like a, a example of like, you, you got to be aware of your delivery and maybe I should have been more aware. I, again, I, I have, I've had many conversations with people about this so far. But I stand by what I said. I think it's still very, very sad and unfortunate that people will leverage black and brown folks to promote things. And then at the end of the day, yes, you may get a check then, but like thinking about the long-term impact, the equity, are you on their board? Do they have people that look like you? I, I can't help but think about those things because I've been in this work for so long and I've seen it. I know what it looks like. So, but mm-hmm. here we are. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Gonna exactly. be the most hated DEI ah. person by the end of the year. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm putting, putting that on my bingo card. <laughs> I'm just saying, hey, it could, be. It, it could be a thing. But again, but, I, but I, I guess the the big question becomes, but are you wrong? I'm just minding my business. Just keep minding my business, unless I'm asked. <laughs> you know. Girl, that's 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 why you don't I see know. me online very much. That's why that's literally why you do not see me online. And I swear, I swear, I keep saying I gotta I have gotta have more more of an online presence and I am inspired by you and I'm slowly working towards that. But I this is this it's is hard. why I don't do it's it. It's hard. This is why I don't um, do it. And it's it's risky in a lot of ways, but um one thing I'm doing is, you know, we talk about this all all the time, is just diversifying my income, working on building passive income streams that have nothing to do with my name that people won't even know are mine um, because I just can't, I can't, (laughs) like, I I don't, I'm not going to ever be one of those people that can, because of all that I've seen and done. So at this point, I can't be one of those like DEI practitioners that's just like, here, can you come do this training and shut up and go? No, I'm not that person. I'm not the one or the two anymore. When I first started, maybe now, not there anymore, not there anymore. So any last yeah. words, things you want to share? Yeah. Um, no, no. Just I think we covered no. it all. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in learning more about yeah. Karen and her work or working with her, um, she is, I like to call her the middle manager guru. Hit her up, theprofessionaladult.com. All her social media is linked below. <laughs> if you are interested in coaching for leaderships or executives, 
I'm your girl. Um, I also have a book called the inclusive leadership journal. So even if you don't want to talk to me or interact with me, you can do the work yourself, um, and jumpstart your, your inclusive leadership journey in 90 days with some real practical reflective exercises. So check it out. Link is in the bio. Um, and yeah, I'll see you all back here for another episode of DEI in five tomorrow. It will, I promise be five minutes and not 30 much like this one, but when Karen and I get together, we have a lot to say. So <laughs> You know, watch what you want. Don't watch what you don't want to watch. It's all good. All right, y'all. Until later. Thanks so much. Bye. Hey, bye.